31, Melly. Don't let Addie see that or she'll never leave you alone about it, Alex says. I take the bridal magazine from her and admire the miniature dress. It's similar to mine, so she'll match her auntie. I hope she doesn't experience a bout of shyness. She gets like that sometimes. Yeah, but it will be a small wedding. Eighty people at the absolute most. I hate to break it to you, Melly, but eighty people at a wedding is not exactly small. Alex's smile drops. She lifts her heavy bulk an inches closer to me. Are you planning on inviting your mother? She whispers. She looks around, likely ensuring that my mother's not hovering. Of course, I am, I tell her. Don't start with me, Alex, okay? Things got ugly enough with Jason a few days ago. I lean back on the couch and drop the magazine on the coffee table. It's not fair that she gets to come here and cause all this drama. I sigh loudly and close my eyes. You know I'm always Team Melly. I know. I'm sorry. I just don't need another guilt trip from your husband. He's stuck in the middle. He loves both of you. I'm not asking him to choose. I'm not asking him to take sides. I am going to tell him off if he tries to pull some shit like he did the other day again. I want to focus on the wedding. Too bad you can't come test the food with us. Ananda's meeting us there Saturday afternoon. Thank goodness for Molly, I say with a sigh just as my mother walks into the living room. The pinched look on her face must mean she heard what I said about Adam's mother. She comes over, sits on the end of the couch, and picks up my bridal magazine. She reaches for the reading glasses sitting on top of her head and puts them on. Oh, Alex, I got Addie to sleep. She put up a hard fight. She flips the pages and says, Is your dress in here, Melanie? This is the first time I've seen her since last week. She looks thinner, and her crow's feet are more pronounced, but I keep my mouth shut. Maybe she's tired from running after a two-year-old all day. I lift my hand and gesture for the magazine back. I flip through until I come to the marked page. Something like this, I tell her. It's the same designer. That's not the exact dress, but it's very similar. She lifts the magazine and studies the dress. I wait for her to say something negative like she always does. I look at Alex, and it looks like she's holding her breath. It's pretty, she says, surprising me. I knew you wouldn't care for the frilly stuff. This will look good on you. My mother's face spreads into a genuine smile. Thank you. I take the magazine and flip to the back. This is what Addison is going to wear. She has a poofy version of my dress. Molly wants to know if you want to get dark blue dresses to offset the light blue that Alex and Ananda are wearing. Her smile dips as soon as she hears the name Molly. She purses her lips and takes her reading glasses off her face. Alex stands up, her stomach protruding. She places a hand on it and wobbles away, telling us that the baby is sitting on her bladder. I suppose that means I'm invited to my daughter's wedding then. I honestly wasn't sure until just now. I guess I should be grateful. Deciding not to take the bait, I say, I was always going to invite you. I stand and take the magazine. Let's not do this. Running away again. That stops me in my tracks Adam telling me that I'm a runner comes to mind. So, I stand my ground and turn to face her. Every time I come near you, you flee. I stand there in stony silence and wait for her to say more. I'm your mother. We should be able to have a conversation, Melanie. I'm not perfect, but I never laid a hand on you. I've always loved you and wanted the best for you. I still do. You have a funny way of showing it. Why? Because I pushed you. 
Because I had high expectations. Because you spent my entire life making me feel less than when I couldn't meet the expectations that you set. Because on one of the most important days of my life, I heard you tell my aunt that you wish you had stopped having kids after you had Jason. And that I was nothing but trouble and difficult to be around. I thought you'd appreciate my absence. Anyway, she says as if she didn't hear a word I just said, I wish I could have been there with you last Saturday just like I was when you went prom dress shopping. Yeah, I remember that. I was so excited about junior prom, but you hated the dress I wanted. So much so that you walked out of the store and refused to pay for it. I think you said that I had already wasted your time, but I was not going to waste your money. Remember that. Once was enough for me. I learned a lesson that day, so I should thank you. What? That you can go around me to your father to get what you want. She stands too, all attempts of making nice gone. He told me he loved the dress, but that's not the lesson I'm talking about. But it did help because he kind of resented you, even then. No, I learned that I'd have to make my own money and make my own decisions. I had a job and bought my own dress for senior prom. When I see the hurt look in her eyes, I regret my words about dad resenting her. I meant what I said. It's not my intention to hurt her, but every time she pulls at an old scab, my instinct is to strike back. Yes, I'm the terrible mother who ruined all your moments and doomed to pay for it for all eternity. I throw my hands up in defeat. This is why I leave when you're around. You push all my buttons. You want me to take half the blame because you were a shitty mother to me, and I refuse to do that. You're doing it again. You're pitting me against Jason, but I won't let you do it this time. I'm his mother, just like I'm yours. Manicures, shopping, and wedding planning with Molly won't change that. This is absurd, even for you, mother. I walk around her and stand on the opposite side of the room. I visibly exhale in relief when Alex returns. I'm going upstairs, Alex. Do you need anything before I go? Already. Is Adam back? I shake my head and remind her that Adam is helping Uncle Finn with something. Well, then. A smile lights up her face, and she hooks an arm through mine. We're going to eat strawberry ice cream and watch reruns of the Golden Girls. Please. She bats her eyelashes, and I relent. Go sit down. I'll get the ice cream. She waddles away, grabs the TV remote, and sits on the couch. Are you going to have some, Diane? Alex asks my mother. We have vanilla almond Swiss and butter pecan if you prefer. I grab bowls and pull out the unopened pint of strawberry and silently pray that mother will decide to go to her room early, but once again, I'm forsaken. Strawberry for me, Melanie. Our love for strawberry-flavored desserts is the one thing that we all have in common. We always had strawberry ice cream at home growing up. After bringing three bowls, Topped with whipped cream, Alex turns on our favorite old sitcom. She had never watched the show before she met me. In fact, my mother would watch reruns of it when I was a child and I'd watch too. Most of the jokes went over my head, but now it's one of my favorite shows. Two episodes later, Adam knocks on the door, and Alex asks him to come in. He pulls me on his lap and kisses me senseless in front of everybody. He finally pulls away when my mother loudly clears her throat. It turns out, Molly loves this show too, and Adam has seen every episode. So, for the next hour, the three of us sit together and laugh. He even shares my second bowl of ice cream with me. Everything okay, he asks me when we get upstairs to our apartment. Did she do something to upset you? I get on my toes and wrap my arms around his neck. Adam, I say, doing my best Uncle Finn impersonation, I missed you. 
Is Uncle Finn okay? He's fine. I'm the one who's Mashugana for dealing with his ass all night. He tricked me. He said he had some paperwork he wanted me to look at, but he really asked me over there to help look through a bunch of dating profiles. He's been swiping right all night. 32. Adam February brought crazy weather that included two blizzards and an ice storm, but the crazier the weather got, the calmer the drama became. There was no more bickering between Mel and her mom and zero confrontations between me and Jason. Even the phone calls have waned. I wish they would stop completely, but at least they are limited to only the mornings now. According to Mel and my mom, they've taken care of all the big items for the wedding. Mel's got her dress, we have a church, food, and flowers. The only big detail left is the cake, but since Mel knows the owner of the bakery and the type of cake she wants, she's not stressing about it. In fact, she has an appointment to go cake tasting next month. We even got the joint bank accounts so Mel can track every penny we spend. Unfortunately for Mel, she has no idea about my other accounts, but that's okay for now. I'll just need to find the right time to tell her. Maybe when we get back from our honeymoon. February not only brought crazy weather, but fun times too. Alex's baby shower is being hosted by Jason's best friend and his wife. Melanie and Ananda helped Sandy plan, and on the morning of the shower, we were met with dry but bitter cold temperatures and biting winds. It reminded me that my wife will need a new car before next winter. It is also the first time, other than when her mother blew into town, that she's needed me. Hey, wife, I say a couple of hours after she left to go set up. Don't worry, I won't forget to bring your clothes. She was in such a hurry, she forgot to bring her change of clothes. Or the gift you left here, I snicker. Thanks, stud. I smile at my nickname. What are you doing? Laying in the middle of our bed. All alone, I might add. You'd better be alone. I can hear a hard edge to her voice, and I smile at her sudden bout of jealousy. Yes, dear. Put those claws away. Can you come now, Adam? We need help. Alex is one of my best friends, so I only complained a little about going to a baby shower. Going there hours early doesn't exactly sound great, but Mel does sound a little stressed. We just need help with setting up the decorations and stuff. Please. Before she said please, I was already out of bed and digging through our closet for clothes. Sure, love. Text me the address and I'll be there soon. Five minutes later, I'm downstairs and just about to make my exit out the back door when Diane pokes her head out. Are you leaving for the shower now? Her voice is tentative and small. Jason pokes his head out too. Mel needs help, is all I say. Jason and I haven't talked since I got in his face almost a month ago. Would you mind if I ride with you? I'm a nervous driver in the snow, and I'd like to help too. I stare at her, unsure of how to respond. Let me call Mel and see how much help she needs. She purses her lips, crosses her arms, and waits. Mel must be inundated because she doesn't balk at her mother coming, so I spend the next fifteen minutes in my car with my passenger. Neither one of us said a word the entire time. The instant we arrive, Ananda grabs Diane and takes her into the kitchen to set up the food. It's like a pink explosion when I get there. I'm not sure if it's because Alex is having a girl or because Jake's wife is obsessed with the color, but I've never seen so much pink in my life, including the pink shirt my wife said I had to wear. It took everyone three hours to get the house decorated and set up for the shower. It didn't help that Jake and Sandy's seven-month-old son was attempting to crawl all over the place. I ended up strapping him to my chest while we worked. By the time the guests start to arrive, I'm no longer needed to do manual labor and am left to enjoy the party. If those two spent less time kissing, we would have been done hours ago, Mel whispers to me. Our hosts are in a corner of the kitchen and Jake has his wife pinned to the wall while he grazes her neck. 
she lets out a shaky laugh and pushes him away. Their son, Jackson, smiles at me. He's a curly-haired, tanned version of his father. Even though he's only seven months old, he has a head full of dark curls. He laughs, and drool runs down his chin. I wipe it with his bib, and he sticks a chubby hand in my hair and pulls. I put an arm around my wife and pull her close. You having fun? I ask her. Are you going to take a turn doing that? I jerk my chin toward Ananda, who is wrapping a long piece of toilet paper around Alex's stomach. Whatever the hell that is. The baby in my arms grabs my nose and starts to bounce, laughing and gurgling. He likes you. Mel tries to reach for him, but he pushes her hand away and lays his head on my shoulder. Back in Dublin, I was the barren whisperer. I embellish my brogue, and I don't miss how my wife licks her lips and looks at my mouth. We lean against the wall and look in the living room as everyone laughs and talks at once. You know, love, I'd like nothing more than for us to find an empty room upstairs and bend you over. I lower my head close to her ear, letting my mouth tickle her earlobe. I didn't get a chance to give that pussy a pounding this morning. I lick her earlobe, and she jumps in shock. Jackson claps and drools a big glob of spit on my hand. She hooks her free arm with mine and rests her chin on my bicep. I lean down and kiss the top of her head. I got a tour of the house before you got here. She lets out a loud whistle. It's gorgeous. The master bedroom is almost as big as our apartment. They have a pool too. That's so impractical here, isn't it? We only get a couple of months of summer, but I would love a pool. Honestly, their old house is like my dream house. Life's unfair sometimes, isn't it? She sighs wistfully. A tinge of guilt hits, and I open my mouth to tell her everything, but someone in the other room laughs, and I realize this is not the time or the place. You want to buy their old house? I ask her instead. She lets out an undignified snort. It's not for sale, but we couldn't afford it even if it were. Besides, I like the city. We might have to find a fixer-upper. That wouldn't be so bad since you're good with your hands. She puts her face on my bicep and kisses it. Jackson reaches for Mel's hair and gives it a good tug. I remove his little hand and he whacks me on the nose and laughs. Our little bubble is interrupted when Addie comes running to us with her grandma behind her. She seems irritated when she sees me holding another baby. She raises both her hands and tries to climb my legs. My Uncle Ada, she says. Diane picks her up and when Mel drops my arm, she puts Edison in my free arm. She kisses my cheek and rests her head on my shoulder. Told you, Mel. I wink at my wife and she rolls her eyes. I bounce both kids. So, Diane says, making no moves to walk away, I see you're comfortable with kids, Adam. You're an only child, right? Mel goes completely rigid. The only child of a single mother, I tell her, weighing my words carefully. But my mom comes from a large family, and I have cousins back in Dublin. Maybe I can take you for a visit next year, love, I say to Mel. She gives me a doubtful look. For once, I'm happy to have her mother nearby. There's no way she'll go on a tirade about how we can't afford European vacations with her mother around. I can practically hear her doing the calculations in her head. Maybe, she says, but I know she's only saying that for the sake of our audience. When Diane turns away, Mel shakes her head no. Ireland, her mother says. Melly's never been out of the country. Well, we're going to Paris this summer, I tell her. I remember when Melly's idea of a vacation was going to the Jersey Shore for the weekend. You always had big dreams. Much bigger than your pocketbook. You should have found yourself a doctor at the hospital where you work. Mel bristles, and so do I, but before I can put her in her place, my wife speaks. Did you give Jason this same speech? Last time I checked, his wife and I do the exact same thing. 
Her mother waves her off and looks over at her son and daughter-in-law. Her face lights up when she sees them, which is something that never happens when she looks at her daughter. It's different. Men take care of us. I'm just saying that a teacher can't afford to give you that champagne lifestyle. Maybe beer, but I guess you made your choice. She smiles then almost as if she just said something nice. I take care of my wife just fine, and she takes care of me. Don't worry about us, mother. Aren't you the one living with your son now? You can't afford Adam's apartment. And I'm sure Jason will give you quite the discount when you finally move. Adam and I will be fine. Don't spend a single minute worrying about us. Jesus, why are you two so thin-skinned? We can't even have a conversation without one of you taking it the wrong way. 33. Melly. Not even my mother's toxicity could bring me down today. After cleaning up and putting the bulk of the presents in Adam's truck, we finally make it back home. My mother rode with Jason, and by the time we drop the gifts off, she's already in her room. The second we close the door behind us, Adam pins me to the wall and kisses the breath out of me. We leave a trail of discarded clothes on the way to the bedroom and by the time we burst through the door, we're both naked and hungry for each other. I drop to my knees in front of him and take his hard dick in my mouth. I take him deep enough to make him stumble and mutter a curse. His brogue is thick with lust. He tastes so good in my mouth that I moan like a horny slut. He holds my head and fucks my mouth. I've dreamed of your lips wrapped around my dick for years, Mel. Take it, love. Take all of it. All of it is a lot, way too much for my mouth and I gag. After catching my breath, he shoves his cock in my mouth again, and this time, I'm ready for him. I relax and take him almost to the base. Yeah, just like that. With you on your knees pleasing your husband. You love that, don't you, Mel? I mumble a yes and nod my head, but he pulls himself out. No, I whine. Put it back. I open my mouth and reach for him, but he steps back. Adam. I whine again. He grabs my wrist and lifts me to my feet as if I weigh nothing more than a feather. He spins me around and slaps me hard on the ass. Once he's pinned me to the wall, his broad hard chest on my back, he grinds that big cock on my ass. Tell me you love it. He puts my earlobe in his mouth and sucks. Tell me how much you love fucking me. I love it. I always knew I would. He kisses the side of my neck and runs his tongue along my hot skin at the exact moment he spreads my legs apart. He grabs my hips and pulls my ass closer to his body. His hot, wet mouth leaves kisses down my neck and along my spine, all the way to my ass. He slaps me again. Harder this time, catching me off guard, and I bite my lip at the deliciousness of it. Do it again, I order. I call the shots in here. He puts both of his large hands on mine and raises them above my head, practically pinning me to the wall. You want to count every penny we spend. I don't care. You fill my apartment with girly shit and plants. Fine, but in here, I own you. I whimper again, and the woman inside of me, the one who would never let a man speak to her like this is gone. At least for now. This is my husband. My Adam, and I'll give him this. I'm talking to you, he growls right before he roughly bites my shoulder. I know there'll be a mark there, but I don't care. You own this pussy, I tell him. I already know that. I want to own you. Say it. He grinds into me. His arousal triggers mine and some of my moisture runs down my thighs. I moan like a whore and spread my legs further apart. Far enough apart that he could slip right in, only he doesn't. He slaps me again. You own me. I surrender, 
and I don't care. I wave the white flag. I capitulate and gladly wave goodbye to feminist Melly. Slutty Melly is here now. Instead of giving me his hard cock, he gets on his knees, kisses both ass cheeks, spreads my lips apart, and eats my pussy from the back. Two thick fingers find their way inside of me while his hot tongue caresses my clit. I throw my head back, relishing the feel of him and the sounds he makes while he pleasures me. He teases, sucks, and bites my inner thighs. He finds the right spot. It's the perfect friction with his tongue and fingers, but just as I start to fall over the edge, he abruptly stops and steps away. I stumble to the side, nearly falling, but he catches me. He lifts me as if I'm no more than a paper doll and tosses me on the bed. The breath comes out of me, and I try to move on the bed, but he dives on top of me, bends my legs, and spreads them open. Where are you going, love? I told you I'm in charge in here. He positions his big body between my thighs, and with no warning, he fills me. Adam, I moan. I grind underneath him, waiting for him to give me more. Adam, I reach behind him and slap his ass. Something changes in his eyes. They go from blue to almost black, and he grabs my hands again. He lifts them above my head, pulls his dick almost all the way out, and slams back into me. I told you, I'm in charge. You're going to learn, Melanie Flynn, that this body is mine. Gentle kisses tickle my collarbone, and I giggle at my husband. The same bossy growly bear from an hour ago has turned into a kitten. He kisses the love bites while his hand caresses my hip, but I don't complain. I love it. I snuggle closer to him. After two rounds of lovemaking, we're underneath the bedspread and my hands can't stop touching his chiseled body. Your body is just insane. My hands travel up his taut stomach to his wall of a chest. I'm glad you like it. I love it, but if we woke up tomorrow and you were fat, I'd love that too. I'll take any version of you. He pulls me closer and kisses my temple. As long as this and this are still the same. I put my hand above his beating heart, then I touch his temple. That's the most beautiful thing anyone has ever said to me, love. Tell me something no one else knows, he says. This has become our nightly tradition. At night when we're alone and naked, we share our secrets. I'm deathly afraid of frogs. If I see one, I'll freak out. I was about nine when a boy put a frog down my shirt. I can still feel how slimy it was. I make a face and start to scratch my body. He stares at me before he bursts into laughter. I swat his chest. It's not funny. Jason had one when we were kids. I could barely sleep that first night. Your turn. I had a frog too. My snake ate it. I put them in the same tank. I was only about ten and thought they could be friends. I asked Uncle Finn to help me look for it. His name was Jumper. When I told him I'd put them in the same tank, he whacked me upside the head and told me my snake ate my frog. I felt so guilty. I put a hand to my mouth and feel the bile rising in the back of my throat. After making a few gagging sounds, he rolls his eyes and says, You're such a girl. At least I'm not a frog murderer. And the idea that your mother let you have a frog and a snake. Disgusting. She's not a wimp like you. I'm going to need ice cream to help me recover from your snake and frog drama. I extricate myself from his side, but he pulls my wrist and I fall on his chest. He gently tilts my face to his and kisses my lips. He reaches for my ass and caresses it while I walk away. I grab my short, silk robe on the way out of the room. After filling a bowl with ice cream, I return to my husband. 
Adam is sitting up in the bed with his back leaning against the headboard. I straddle him and sit on his lap. He pulls me closer, and I wrap my legs around him. He unties my robe, leaving my body completely exposed. Where did you go to college? I ask him, suddenly eager to learn everything about my husband. Brown University, he says without meeting my eyes. The spoon of ice cream freezes halfway to my mouth, and I let out a loud whistle. The Ivy League. I'm impressed. I suddenly understand why he's not too worried about debt. He got a scholarship. You majored in education. And economics, he says. I have a master's degree in economics, too. What about you? Where did you go? Rutgers University. Confession time. Tell me something. It can be anything. I try to eat a spoon of ice cream, but he steals it and puts it in his own mouth. Um. He looks at the ceiling while he thinks. I don't like bananas. I shove more ice cream in his mouth and roll my eyes. That's lame, Adam. You said anything. Something profound. Something life-altering. I'm building up to something here. He slides his hands under my robe and cups my ass, pushing me closer to him. I have something you can sit on, wife. My sexy-as-fuck wife. He sucks on the base of my neck, and I sigh at the sensation. He lifts and places me on top of his hard cock, and I sink down in it. Okay. Life-altering events, here we go. I slowly start to grind on top of him. I'm already sore, and he's stretching me fully. My grandma asked me to join the priesthood. She was on her deathbed, so I told her I would do it as soon as I was old enough. I lied to a dying woman, Mel. I had zero intentions of ever becoming a priest. I put my bowl of ice cream down and focus on the man in front of me. I put both hands behind his head and take him in a deep kiss. I ride his cock while his rough hands grab my ass. You're a bad boy, Adam Flynn. I should get out my ruler and spank that deliciously tight ass of yours. If anyone is doing the spanking in our bedroom, it's going to be me, Mrs. Flynn. And he smacks my ass to prove his point. Your turn, love. Tell me something profound. His hands maneuver my hips. He lowers his head and sucks a nipple into his mouth. His lips are cold from the ice cream, and the sensation causes me to shiver. Eyes on me, I tell him. He lets go of my nipple and his eyes clash with mine. I hold my breath and say, this moment right here is the most profound of my life. Why? Because you're making love to your husband. He kisses me again, his soft lips driving me so crazy I almost forgot what he asked. Eyes on me, Adam. He complies. He holds his breath and waits for me to speak. Because I'm in love with my husband. His breathing stops. I lean in for a kiss, and he moves his head back. Large hands cradle my face, and blue eyes lock with my brown. Say that again. His voice is soft, barely just a whisper. I'm in love with my husband. I love you, Adam. No words come out of him. He stares into my eyes, then I feel him convulse underneath me. His cock pulses inside of me, and I know he's just found his release. Tell me you mean it. He closes his eyes and rests his forehead on mine. You can't take this back, Mel. It will kill me if you wake up tomorrow and pretend you don't remember. Promise me you won't take this back. I glide my hands in his hair and caress his skull. I kiss his lips before I look into his eyes again. I'll never take it back. When I'm old and on my deathbed, I'll think of this moment as I take my last breath. I love you, Adam Finnegan Flynn, my husband.
And I love you, Melanie Elise Flynn, my wife. I think I always have. We were made for each other, love. Do you have any siblings on your father's side? We made love again after my confession. Hours later, we're still in bed. This is my favorite part. This is when I learn things about my husband that few people know. I can tell he stopped breathing. I look into his face, but he looks away. I'm happy being my mother's only child, he says. I don't like talking about him, Mel. He leans back and closes his eyes. I've talked about him more with you these past few weeks than I have in years. Did you want any growing up? I ask him, changing the subject away from his father. I have cousins. I never really thought of it. My mom's family is big, and I've never been lonely. Tell me something you want. Something money could buy if we had the funds. But it has to be a want, not a need. I lean on his body and think. I've never been rich, and I've been practically on my own since I was 18, so money has always been an issue for me. I think I'd like to travel. Buy first-class plane tickets and fly off to Bali or Tahiti on a whim. I'd love to own a vacation home someplace like Myrtle Beach. Stuff like that. What about you? He reaches over and pushes a piece of hair off my forehead. I'd like to give you everything you want. Do I have you? Till my last breath. Then I have everything I want and need. So do I, love. 34, Adam. My legs feel like lead by the time I hop off my bike Monday morning. I'm drenched with sweat and tiptoe into the bathroom to shower. I meant to go to the gym this morning, but I didn't want to be away from Mel any earlier than I had to. We spent Sunday alone in our apartment talking and making plans for our future. Truth be told, I never wanted to go to Las Vegas. I was worried she would meet someone there, but that trip was the best thing that could have happened. She married me, and despite a rocky start, she's still here. Not only that, she's in love with me. Eager to kiss her one more time before I leave for work, I rush through my shower, but she's no longer in bed when I get to the bedroom. Mel. I leave the room with only the towel wrapped around my waist. Mel. I stop short when I find her in the kitchen wearing nothing but her short robe. Why are you up so early? The smell of fresh coffee hits my nose, but she's also pulled out several containers of food from the fridge. Do you know that you spent $79 on lunches last week? And that doesn't include the extra $23 you spent at Starbucks. She grabs a Tupperware bowl from the cabinet and starts filling it with leftovers from last night's dinner. I sigh loudly and run a hand through my damp hair. I like my coffee, and I'm a growing boy. I gotta eat lunch. I turn my back and roll my eye to the ceiling. I love this about her but it's fucking annoying. I'm making you coffee, and I bought you a to-go mug the other day. I'm also going to be packing you lunch from now on. She crosses the room and stands in front of me. I smile when I see the appreciative gleam in her eyes. But don't worry. You can get coffee and buy lunch on Fridays. I huff and twist my mouth. That's not necessary, Mill. We're fine. I know, but you'll thank me when we own our own home. It's just a small sacrifice, Adam. She moves closer and wraps her arms around my damp body. And I'll make sure you have enough coffee and lunch, just from home. Does this mean you'll stop spending money on nail polish? Every time you go out, you buy more. She purses her lips and I smile in victory. At least food and coffee are necessities. I add that just to twist the knife. She pinches my side in retaliation but nods. Fine. She looks less happy than I do. Thanks, love, for looking out for our future. I bend down and kiss her cheek, and she smiles happily. Who knew I married such a cheapskate? Cheapskate Melly is very responsible. 
Right now, 1950s Millie is going to pack your lunch. Tonight, slutty Millie will rock your world. She walks away and pours coffee in a black to go mug. Who knew there were so many of you in there? Maybe I should have you committed. Very funny. If you do that, you'll miss out on slutty Millie. I wouldn't want to do that. I love you, she yells to my retreating back. Love you too, cheapskate. And do you think 1950s Melly can make me breakfast? 35. Melly. I have something to show you, love, Adam says. His facial expression gives nothing away. His blue eyes are clear as always, but my husband does not offer me a smile. He doesn't give me his trademark playful smirk either. I minimize my spreadsheet and close my laptop. My eyes follow Adam while he walks to the bedroom. I get up to follow him, but only make it halfway down the hall until he comes out carrying my old tote bag. My eyes widen in shock when I see it, and I reach for it, but Adam pulls it away. Uh uh, love, he says. Your days with this bag of dicks are over. A laugh escapes, and I cover my mouth with my hand, but Adam doesn't laugh back. In fact, he looks irritated. Something flashes in his eyes, and his jaw ticks. He opens the bag, but I lunge for it. He takes one step back and holds the bag over his head, making it impossible for me to get it. He pulls out an unopened box and peels off a sticky note from it. Let's hope this one does a better job of getting out the cobwebs than what's-his-name did the other night. Ananda. He crumples the note in his hand and tosses it on the floor before he slowly pulls the long, purple dildo out of the box. Care to explain, wife? His voice is low, almost deadly, and I inadvertently take a step back. I cross my arms and meet his hard stare. Care to explain why you're going through my stuff, husband? He smiles, showing off his perfect, white teeth. I like it when you call me husband, and no, I don't care to explain. Not beyond finding this bag shoved in the back of the closet. Neither do I. I cross my arms and stare in his face. He waves the dildo around and says, explain. I think a dildo is pretty self-explanatory. Oh, so you're going to be a smart ass. I meant the note, damn it. He grinds his teeth and his jaw ticks again. I don't answer, and he speaks. My imagination is running wild, Mel. If I'm reading between the lines, Ananda got you a dildo because you fucked some guy who didn't know how to satisfy you. Is that right? I leave his question unanswered and walk to the fridge. I pull out a cold bottle of water and pray that he drops the subject. It won't matter to him that this happened way before we got married. Before we were anything. I curse myself for not hiding the bag better. I finally close the fridge door and turn around, only to practically collide with his chest. I walk around him and sit on the couch. As soon as I do, he approaches and sits so close to me, our thighs touch. He rummages through the bag and pulls everything out. Look at this one. He turns it on, and the pink vibrator starts to shake. And this one. He turns on the switch and the vibrating tongue starts to dart in and out. And this is my personal favorite. He holds the dildo Ananda gave me in the air. This is the one that came with the note. I shrug and put the bottle of water to my lips. He inches closer, throws an arm across my shoulders, and kisses my cheek. It's kind of funny, love. I'm not mad. I mean, if you needed to get off, all you had to do was knock on my door. He smiles at me and I relax, laying my head on his shoulder. I haven't used that stuff in months. I do a good job of keeping you satisfied. I laugh at his arrogance. He bends down and kisses my temple, and I sigh. You do. 
you're the best at that. I guess whoever forced Ananda to get you this purple beauty couldn't get the job done. He laughs out loud, and so do I. I'm so relieved that he's not being irrational about it, I say, not even close. I let out another laugh. Adam doesn't say anything back, but I sigh at the feel of his fingertips on my arm. It was over in record time. It was all a big nothing. Not memorable at all. When? One word, but that single word makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The gentle touch on my arm stops, and he's gone completely rigid. When? He repeats again when I don't answer. Over two years ago. It was maybe a month after you moved in here. We weren't anything. I'd only seen you maybe twice at that point. You could hear a pin drop in the living room. He stands abruptly, grabs the bag, and starts to walk away. Adam. Come on, I start to follow him, but I jump in surprise when he punches a wall. You went out and fucked a guy, Mel. I've wanted you since the moment I laid eyes on you, and you go out and do this. He runs a hand through his hair and starts to pace. Adam, we weren't together. We weren't anything. And don't yell at me. I lunge for the bag, but he sidesteps me and holds the bag over his head. My argument does nothing to calm him down. He closes the space between us and looms in front of me. I put my hands on my hips and stare in his face. His blue eyes are like a storm. His nostrils flare, he takes an abrupt step back and yanks the door open. Where are you going? I'm going to get rid of this shit. He points to the bag. What? Why? A lot of couples use sex toys together. What's the big deal? You think I'm going to fuck you with a plastic dick? He storms out and slams the door behind him. I stand there, stunned, and rest my head in my hand. I didn't even remember that time. Damn Ananda and her stupid fucking note. A rational person wouldn't be upset, but Adam's not rational. At least not when it comes to me and another man. It takes him twenty minutes to come back. I'm still standing in the middle of the living room when he bursts through the front door and says, I drove it somewhere and dumped it. You'll never see that tote bag again. I roll my eyes to the ceiling and turn away from him, not sure how to handle the raving madman in front of me right now. I only make it two steps before I feel his hand on my elbow. He spins me around and lifts me off my feet. Let's get a few things straight, wife. He carries me to the bedroom and closes the door behind us. Was that the last time you were with a man who isn't me? Yes, Adam. I cross my arms and wait. No more plastic dicks or vibrating wands. I get you off. Me. These hands. He raises both huge hands up. This mouth and tongue. He comes close and runs his tongue along my bottom lip. He bites it and sucks. My panties instantly moisten. And this dick. He places both my hands on his hard cock. He picks me up again and tosses me on the bed. I'm going to make you come with each of them right now. He lands on top of me and his mouth crashes on mine. He's hungry for me. His kiss is deep. He's kissing me as if this is our first and our last kiss. He leaves my mouth long enough to suck the base of my neck. I curse at the sensation, and I mentally prepare myself to wear a scarf around my neck for the next few days. Off. He mutters that word right before his hand lands on the elastic waist of my yoga pants. I kick the offending pants and underwear off. He jumps off the bed long enough to undress. By the time he's naked, so am I, and I'm spread eagle on the bed eagerly waiting for him. His lips land on mine again, and his hands slide between my legs. 
Two fingers find their way inside my warm slit. I moan his name and wrap a leg around him. He fucks me with two fingers and rubs my clit with his thumb. He roughly sucks a nipple into his mouth and I come on his fingers. He traces his tongue up my sternum to my mouth. That's one. He kisses my mouth gently. I get no chance to come down from my high. He licks his way south this time, tracing his tongue all the way to my spread thighs. He teases my pussy until I cry out his name, but he has no mercy on me. He licks and sucks until I come on his tongue. That's two. He rolls me on my side and slides in behind me. Adam, I say, breathless. I don't know if I can come again. My heart rate hasn't calmed down, and I'm still riding the high of the second orgasm. He lifts my leg and enters me from behind. You can, love. And you will. Now, tell me who rules this body. He gives me the long, slow, and deep strokes that I love. My eyes roll to the back of my head at the feel of him inside of me. Tell me who owns this pussy. Who, he asks again. You, Adam. Only you. 36. Melly. The balloons bounce along the wall, and my heart thumps so loud, I'm afraid the nurses can hear it. It's been a hell of a day. Alex called me at 10 o'clock in the morning, claiming she was having contractions. Jason was already at work and in the operating room. When I got downstairs, she was leaning over the kitchen table while my mother rubbed her back. Addie was in the middle of the kitchen crying. Her water broke in my car on the way to the hospital. I remember the look on her face and the liquid seeping into my cloth seats and dripping down Alex's leggings. She reached over and grabbed my hand, squeezing it as tears streamed down her reddened cheeks. Things only worsened when we arrived at the hospital. The doctors rushed Alex into the operating room for an emergency C-section when they discovered the baby was breech and her heart rate had dropped. Jason walked in right as they were wheeling Alex away, and I've never seen my brother so afraid before. His knees almost buckled. It was only when I grabbed his hand, pulled him into a hug, and told him everything would be okay that he relaxed. It didn't last long though. He changed into fresh scrubs and went into the operating room, only this time he wasn't the surgeon. He was the worried husband and father. Even now, knowing that she's out of surgery and in a private room, my heart won't stop thumping. My knees turn to jelly in the middle of the hallway, and my husband stops right along with me. You want me to carry you, love? I look into his blue eyes and wrap my arms around him. The balloons hit him in the face, but he shoves them away and squeezes me in his arms, saying soothing words. I was so scared, Adam. And you weren't there. My eyes fill with tears, but he swipes them away. He cups my face, and I bite my bottom lip and will the tears to stay at bay. I got here as fast as I could, Mel. And he did. He was here thirty minutes after I sent him the text. I don't think I would have made it without him. Despite having Tina, Ananda, and Alex's father here, I was only slightly relaxed when Adam got here and took me into his arms. You did. It's just been an emotional day. I exhale and brush my bangs off my forehead. Let's go meet our niece. He takes my hand in his and leads me this time. He's my pillar of strength. The minute he found me in the waiting room, he pulled me into his arms as if I was the one in distress. We knock on the door, and he slowly pushes it open. He stops walking when I do. I stick my head inside, and when I see Alex in the bed, dressed in her own nightgown, glowing while holding a pink bundle, I sag in relief before walking into the room. Jason hugs me tight, and I feel tears again. They fall freely this time. Thanks for being there, Melly. He kisses my head. 
Jason's best friend and his wife walk in. He's holding a huge bouquet of pink flowers and she has a big brown paper bag in her hand. My mother and Addison walk in right behind them. Mommy! Addison screams. She pulls her hand from my mother's and starts to run to Alex, but Jason catches her before she can get a chance to jump on the bed. You have to be careful and not jump on mommy, Jason says to her. He walks to the bed and gently lays Addison next to Alex. So, I'm glad everyone is here. We had a bit of a scare today, but my sister saved the day. All I did was drive her here Jason, I say. You did more than that. You stayed calm. You had a clear head and Alex told me you made sure she didn't freak out. Adam puts a hand on my shoulder and gently massages it. So, now that we have everyone here, we want to introduce you to Baby Dupree. Please tell us you finally gave this baby a name, Jake says. She's always had a name. We just wanted it to be a surprise. Well, tell us, son, my mother orders. What's my new granddaughter's name? Everyone, meet Melanie Christina Dupree. I let go of the balloons and they hit the ceiling. Both hands cover my mouth as I look around the room. I look at Alex, and she smiles and nods her head. If this is because I drove. We picked this name as soon as we knew she was a girl, Alex says. Melanie after Jason's sister and Christina after mine. It's beautiful, Sandy says. Yes, beautiful, Tina agrees. Melly and Adam, we want you to be the godparents, Jason says. Can I hold her? Alex nods, and I walk to the hospital bed. Adam drags a chair close to the bed, and Alex places the tiny bundle in my arms. 37, Adam. My wife, I'm picking up groceries so I can make dinner. Me, just hurry up and get here. We can order dinner. My wife, almost done. Already in line. And we need to cut back on ordering out. I toss my phone and sigh in frustration, but I pick it back up when it vibrates against the table. It's a picture of the long line at the grocery store. Of course, the line is long. We're bracing for another snowstorm in late March, and my wife has completely lost her mind. True to her word, she's packed me a lunch every day except Fridays. Between our wedding, honeymoon, and saving for a house, she makes sure every penny is accounted for. The good news is, we're due for a warm-up in a few days, so the snow won't last long, but all I want now is for my wife to come home so we can cuddle on the couch and ride out the storm together. It's barely three in the afternoon, but the skies have turned gray, and flurries are already falling. Instead of looking outside and waiting for my wife, I decide to take care of the rainforest she's brought into this apartment. I water the string of pearls hanging above the kitchen window and check the soil of the English ivy and the aloe. I watered the ones in the bathroom earlier, so I know they're okay. I sit on the couch and cross my arms, desperately missing Mill. We spent almost the entire night downstairs. Jason had to go into work due to a car accident, and little Mill spent the entire night crying. We all took turns rocking her to sleep. Now, I'm sleepy but can't fall asleep without my wife in my arms. Who knew being married could be so amazing? Even the nights that we spend on the couch watching TV or talking are better than anything I've ever experienced. To kill some time, I leave the couch and busy myself straightening our bedroom and bathroom. I've never been a slob, but Mel likes everything to be extremely neat. Fifteen minutes later, I cheer in excitement when I hear a knock on the door. Expecting to find my wife on the other side holding several grocery bags, I yank the door open without bothering to look through the peephole. The smile on my face slips as soon as I look into the familiar blue eyes. I see those eyes every time I look in the mirror and every time I see a picture of my father. And now here they are. In the flesh. I push the door closed, but he grabs it and steps inside. 
I didn't invite you in, I say through clenched teeth. I take a step closer and enjoy the fact that even though we look so much alike, I still have about an inch of height on him. It's barely an inch, but I'm still taller. And broader, though I can tell he keeps in good shape. And yet here I am. The voice makes me cringe. He sounds just like our dead father. Leave my apartment. I step back, not wanting to get any closer to him. I've told you that I'm not interested in whatever it is you're after. And if you think I'm after money, he holds a hand up indicating for me to stop talking, and I seethe. Don't silence me, I warn. Why would I think you're after money? You've made it clear that you're not, and Dad left you plenty. He did a good job of hiding it, but the money trail led us straight to you. Is this what this is about? You want the money? The joke's on you, asshole, because I never wanted it, but I'll give it all to charity or burn it before I'd. His brows furrow, and he takes an angry step closer. I can feel the rage radiating from his body, and at this moment, I don't care. In fact, I want him to throw a punch so I can take all my anger out on him. But it's not his fist that he uses, it's his eyes. He stands still and examines my face. I feel like a specimen under his gaze. I turn my back to him, unable to stand his stares any longer. He even smells like our father. I told you I'd be here. His voice sounds less smug than it did over the phone, but there's still a hint of arrogance. You're taller than I thought you would be. The tinge of amusement in his voice surprises me. Not willing to be cowed in my own home, I turn to him. You're exactly like I thought you'd be. So, you thought of me then? I don't know if you're aware, but there's going to be a snowstorm tonight. You should just go to wherever the hell you came from before traffic in this city comes to a standstill. I walk past him and open the door. You've seen me. You want to take a picture for your sister? She's your sister too. She's the one who found you. Found me? I wasn't lost. He makes no move to leave. In fact, he walks around the place, running his hands over the furniture. He even arches an eyebrow when he sees Lola. Why are you so hostile? Why can't you take a hint? I ask. Your voice is just like his, he says. No. That's you. There's a picture we have at the house in Montauk of Father when he was around your age. You're his spitting image. Can you be more offensive? I ask him. You think I want to be like that asshole? You think I want to be some rich prick who takes advantage of and lie to women much younger than he is? You think I'm the type of guy who would cheat on his wife and stash another family out of sight? Hide us like we're some dirty little secret? But it's okay, right, because he has all the cash in the world and can write any check. I can feel the color creeping up my neck. The last time I got this angry was when I woke up to find my wife had abandoned me the morning after our wedding. I punched the wall then, and right now I'd really like to punch him in the face. No, I don't imagine you would. That's all he says. Nothing more, and I find his lacking response has mollified my anger. At least for the time being. You're stubborn like him too. And that gets me to take a step closer to him, ready to push him against the wall and unleash all my anger. You don't intimidate me. I'm the same size as you. I'm taller, I hiss. Now, get the fuck out of my apartment before I throw you out the damn window. I just got here, and I'm not leaving until we have a conversation. I told you I'd come to you. I gave you every opportunity to control the situation. You gave me? I don't need you to give me shit. You might run that damn company. You might be the mighty fucking Ethan Henry Bradford III, but you're not shit to me. I'm your brother, he says, as if that should resolve everything. We share a father. We share DNA. We share a sister who has been losing sleep for months over you. You were never our dirty little secret, only the little brother we never had a chance to know. I'm going to say it again. 
We just want a chance to get to know you. You can make that as easy or as difficult as you want, but we're not going away. The asshole finally steps away from me, walks into my kitchen, and opens my fridge. The ball's on this guy. He very audaciously pulls out the half-finished bottle of that disgustingly sweet wine that Mel drinks. What the hell are you doing? I ask him. Well, you didn't offer me anything to drink. That's probably not a bad thing considering your terrible taste in wine. Don't worry. Big brother to the rescue. I'll send you a case of the best stuff. He puts the wine back and pulls out a bottle of water. After drinking half of it, he puts it down and starts to unbutton his coat. I'm half a second away from grabbing him by the collar and throwing him out when I hear the keys jingling in the front door. My stomach drops at the prospect of Mill walking in on this. Of all the ways I imagined her finding out, this didn't make the list. The plan was to sit her down and tell her, but after we returned from our honeymoon. I look around and consider throwing him in the closet, but it's too late. The door opens and then shuts. Added him. She does that thing where she mimics the way Uncle Finn says my name. The grocery store was a disaster, but 1950s Melly's going to make a delicious dinner. Slutty Melly will take over for the dessert portion of the evening and let you have your way with her. Remember that thing you did the other night when you threw my leg over? I know exactly what she's talking about, and my mouth goes completely dry at the exact moment she sees our guest. She gasps and stops short at the sight of him. I run to her and take the bags out of her hands. I didn't know we had company. She looks from me to him, likely waiting for me to make an introduction, but I have no idea what to say. Then something clicks on her face. Her brows furrow and she takes a step closer to him. She looks from him to me and her mouth opens in shock. Adam, who is this and why is he a clone of you? I stare at her and do my best to come up with a reasonable explanation. Why the hell is there a clone of you in our kitchen? She asks again. Well, I'm older, so he would be a clone of me, the jerk says. I'm Ethan Bradford, and your husband is my little brother. He offers Mel his hand, and she takes it. Her hand goes limp, and she continues to look back and forth at us. Ethan Bradford? The Bradco CEO? The CEO of the world's biggest discount chain? That Ethan Bradford? The bag in my hand drops to the floor. You know who Ethan Bradford is? I ask when I finally regain my ability to speak. Yeah, I used to. Whatever she was going to say got lost, and she shakes her head as if trying to make sense of something. Did Ethan Bradford just say that you and he are brothers? But you're an only child. I'm my mother's only child. I stubbornly maintain my position. Well, unfortunately for your husband, we share a father. You do understand you have two sides to your family, right? Can you shut up and get the hell out of here? He has the nerve to smirk at me, but when I take two small steps in his direction, Mel grabs my wrist and stops my advance. She pulls me into the corner opposite Ethan. Did you just find out about him? That he's your brother? She lowers her voice and points a finger at my unwanted guest. He stands there, watching us and craning his neck. I can't meet her gaze, and my silence is all the answer she needs. I see, she whispers. He's nothing to me. I reach for her, but she takes a step back. But you knew? I asked you, Adam. She looks at Ethan again, taking her time studying him. Part of me wants to turn her around so she can look at me, not him. When she finally turns to me again, I know she's noting the similarities between us. I knew there was a resemblance from the few pictures I've seen, but I didn't realize how many similarities there are until he knocked on the door. There's no denying that we are closely related. I told you he doesn't matter. Well, that hurts considering we've been calling you for months, he says. We? And I guess I know who that New York number belongs to. We have a sister, Ethan says. 
Her name is Elizabeth, he adds. Will you shut up? I yell. Mel steps between us, places a hand on my chest, and holds me in place. I feel a sense of comfort from her touch, but when I try and hold her hand, she drops it. I need to speak to my husband alone for a minute, she says to Ethan. She doesn't hold my hand like she does each time we go to the bedroom. She's ready for bed before me every night, but she never wants to go to bed alone. She always offers me her hand, and I'll lead her to the bedroom. It's become our nightly tradition, but right now, she's avoiding my touch, and I don't like it. 38. Adam This kind of explains a lot, she says the minute she closes the door behind us. Your lackadaisical attitude about money. The American Express, she says, lowering her voice as if she's telling me some secret. This. She holds up her left hand and points at her diamond ring. She starts to take it off, but I grab her hand in mine. Don't you dare take that off, wife. She stares at me, eyes wide, almost as if she's taken aback by my audacity, but I don't back down. I won't ever back down when it comes to her wearing the ring I put on her finger. Don't you dare pull that shit. Not when you've been lying to me the entire time. I've lied about nothing, I say with a derisive snort. I don't give a shit about that guy out there and want nothing to do with him. I'm Molly Flynn's son. Her only child. That's the goddamn truth. So, you're a billionaire now? The entire time you were living here like a frat boy as if it was some kind of rebellion. Is that what I am? Are you using me to make them mad? I picture ten different ways I'm going to make that guy pay as soon as we leave this bedroom, each one more painful than the last. I'm not a Bradford. I'm a Flynn. And no, I'm not a billionaire. And honestly, Mel, I don't know what you mean when you accuse me of using you. This, I say, pointing to the door, that guy out there. It changes absolutely nothing. She wraps her arms around herself, and I'd give anything to have her in my arms right now, but she's not making any move to walk closer to me. I don't even know you. She sits on the bed and puts her face in both hands. Don't be so damn dramatic. My tone comes out sharper than I intend. Yes, I should feel contrite because I can spin this any way I want, but the truth is, I lied. I'm the same person I was before he showed up here. Why is he here now? I sit next to her, but she moves so our bodies don't touch. I let out a loud breath, roll my eyes to the ceiling, and realize I have no choice but to tell her everything. I've always known about them. For as long as I can remember, I've known. She turns to me, her face shocked at my confession. But they only found out about me last year. I guess one of them did some digging on our dead father and found a money trail to my mother. I told you he's always taking care of me financially. He paid for expensive private schools and college. The call started last May. So, almost a year ago. I nod. I answered the first call. It was a shock, really. I remember not knowing what to say. It wasn't him that called. It was the girl. I find myself unable to utter her name or our connection. You mean your sister, Elizabeth, Mel clarifies. Whatever she is. She called. I told her I wasn't interested and not to call again. Then he called and left a message. There were daily calls. Multiple calls per day. Letters, text messages, even a letter from their lawyer. A few months ago, he called. It was after we got married and you were in bed. I answered and told him to fuck off. That was the first time we ever talked. He texted a few days later saying he'd be in Boston this month and wanted to meet. I texted back no. The calls weren't as frequent, but they continued right up until he showed up here this afternoon. She nods, but stays quiet. Needing to touch her, I run the back of my hand on her cheek. She doesn't move away, but I don't get the reaction I want. Why didn't you tell me? 
She searches my face as if I'm a stranger she's trying to get to know. I take her hand and put it on my chest. I don't like to talk about my father, and they are a part of him. You're a part of him, too. I said I don't like to talk about him. She gasps at my loud tone and pulls away from me. I stand up abruptly and start to pace the room. That topic is off limits. Always. I've told you as much as I'm willing to share. She stands too, but she doesn't cower. She closes the distance and points her index finger in my chest. Well, the part of your life that's off limits is in our kitchen. She turns her back to me then, and I imagine she's trying to gather her thoughts. I know her. I know this is far from over. Where did you get this? She asks, pointing at the ring. Tiffany's in Las Vegas. So, it's real? You think I would put a fake diamond on your finger? How much did it cost? I'm not going to dignify that with a response. I can look it up, she threatens. Then look it up, but I'm not going to be the one who tells you. That's obvious. You don't tell me a lot of things. If you're not part of the Bradford fortune, how did you pay for this ring? And don't tell me some bullshit about having a job. I take a deep breath and say, he left me money when he died. I didn't want it. Still don't. I was going to give it all to charity, but Ma begged me not to. She said if I didn't use it for myself, then save it for my children. I used some of the money to buy your ring. It was the first time I ever spent a penny of it. The room is eerily quiet after my admission. I open my eyes and she's staring into my face as if she doesn't even know me. Let me guess, she finally says. Fifty million dollars. When I nod, she walks around me, opens the door, and walks out. I run behind her, but she runs down the hall and opens the front door. I'm getting out of here. Don't follow me. I don't want to hear another word out of your lying mouth. She grabs her purse from the floor, steps out, and slams the door so hard the paintings on the wall shake. Mill. I open the door, but she's already at the bottom of the stairwell. With the snow falling, I know she won't go any further than the apartment below. In fact, I'm convinced of it when I see her car keys on the floor. I slowly close the door and turn to face my unwanted house guest. He's no longer standing in the kitchen. He's sitting on the sectional, flipping through one of Mel's bridal magazines. You need to go. I need to go find my wife. I stand as far away from him as possible. I can feel the monster inside of me scratching to get out, and if I lay a hand on him, I might not be able to stop. He might be almost as tall, but I'm a trained fighter, and I'm sure he's probably never thrown a punch in his entire rich, pampered life. You people are all the same, do you know that? I don't hide the bitterness in my voice. He stands, but luckily for him, he keeps his distance. You're my brother, so you do realize you're talking about yourself, right? I don't force myself on people who have made it clear they don't want to be bothered with me. Have you ever considered that it's not always about you? Hell, it's not even about me. There are other people involved. People who have gotten hurt too much by your asshole father. Leave us alone. For the first time since he barged in here, the smug arrogance slides off his face. I don't see contrition, but it does humanize him a little bit. He takes a step closer and pulls a card out of his pocket. He writes something on it and puts it on the coffee table. Believe it or not, I didn't come here to cause trouble. We really want to know our brother. That's it. I'm here until Sunday. He picks up the card and points to it. The address is there. I really hope to see you. He puts on his coat, but he doesn't walk to the door. He stands in front of me, and I steady his face. It's unsettling how we can look so much like our father. He stands the same way I do. He even has the same black mold beneath his left eye like me. Unable to look anymore, I avert my gaze. We're a small family. 
I have my sister, son, and a cousin on the West Coast we have no relationship with. That's basically all our blood relatives. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, we're your family. He has the nerve to tap me on the shoulder on his way out the front door. 39. Melly. It takes longer than usual for Alex to open the door. As soon as she does, I walk past her and go straight to her kitchen. The only alcohol in their fridge is that fancy German beer they like to drink and a bottle of champagne. Since I can't stand the taste of beer, I reach for the champagne. I don't ask if they're saving it for a special occasion before I pop it open and drink straight from the bottle. Where's your mother-in-law? I ask, lowering my voice so no one else can hear. She's in her room. Where's Addie? She's in the bedroom watching cartoons with Jason. What's wrong? She signals for me to follow. I walk behind her until she reaches the laundry room. She pulls a bunch of tiny pink clothes out of the dryer and fills a laundry basket with them. I grab the basket from her, and we return to the living room. Adam is a big, fat liar, I hiss. Turns out, I know absolutely nothing about the man I stupidly married. I bet I can get an annulment now. He's a fraud. Alex holds a pink onesie in the air, seemingly frozen. Adam? You're Adam? What the hell are you talking about? She raises her eyebrows to the middle of her forehead. And for a split second, I debate telling her. Her hair's a mess, and it looks like she has spit up on her shoulder. She's in gray sweats that have clearly seen better days. There are also bags under her eyes. Don't stop now. What do you mean he's a fraud, she probes. He's been keeping an entire part of his life from me. Honestly, Alex, I don't know how I can ever believe a word he says. You'll never guess what. My words die in my throat when the door opens and shuts. From the heavy footsteps, I know it can only be one person. They continue until they reach the kitchen. His eyes find me immediately, and even though I don't look up and busy myself with folding tiny baby clothes, I can feel his eyes on me. Hey, Alex, he says, as if this is just any other visit. How's little Mel? Other than having her days and nights mixed up, she's great. Let's go home, Big Mel. You promised me dinner, and I'm hungry. Before I can tell him to get lost, I hear a door open. I keep my mouth shut but breathe a sigh of relief when Jason, and not my mother, shows up. Hey, guys. You staying for dinner? I ordered Chinese, and there's going to be plenty. He goes to the fridge and takes out a beer. He offers one to Adam, who surprises me by accepting it. Mel's cooking, Adam says. Don't speak for me. I don't miss the look exchanged between Jason and Alex at my sharp retort. We need to talk, love, and I'd rather not do it here. There's an edge to his voice, one I've only ever heard today, and I don't like it. I no longer believe a word that comes out your mouth, I say back, my tone just as harsh. Mel, we're not going to do this here in front of your brother and Alex. Stop running to Jason every damn time there's something wrong. Your place is upstairs with me. Jason looks at me, takes a seat at the table, and drains his beer. He looks tired, which isn't surprising since he was at work last night and I know little Mel hasn't been an easy baby so far. What the hell is going on now? Jason asks. Can't we go five damn minutes without any drama in this family? It's between me and my wife, Dupree. Stay out of it for once, Adam says. I can see the muscle in his cheek tick. I live here. If you want me to stay out of it, don't bring it to my house, Jason says. You're absolutely right. Let's go, Big Mel. Since when do I take orders from you, Adam? Never. I don't know why you're putting on this caveman act now, but then again, maybe that's who you are. It's not like I ever really knew you anyway. 
he slams the beer down so hard, some of it spills out. Are you still on that? he asks, and I look up and meet his eyes. That's bullshit, and you know it. If you come upstairs, I'll explain, and we can move the hell on. He offers me his hand, but I scrape my chair back, further away from him. You're going to tell me more lies? I never fucking lied. He doesn't yell, but the words are louder than they need to be. In fact, I blame him for the fact that my mother walks into the kitchen. She puts a hand on her chest as if she's surprised to see us here. Goodness, I had no idea everyone was here. What's all the fuss about? Of course, she looks at me when she asks that question. Just here to get my wife, Adam says. You do that a lot, don't you? I remember you were looking for her my first night here. His body goes rigid and his footsteps stall. He turns slowly and faces my mother. His jaw ticks again, and I know he's holding back. I can feel his anger from here. Whether it's because I left, or because of his unwanted guest, or a combination of both, his simmering rage is close to eruption. What's your point, lady? he asks quietly. Way too quietly, for the anger oozing out of him. Don't get smart with my mom, Flynn, Jason says. As long as she minds her business, I won't, Adam says back. It's my business. This is my family. Melanie is my daughter. Oh, please, I say to my mother. I stand between her and my husband. Your fake concern is giving me a cavity. It's not fake, Melanie. Something is off with the two of you. I'm not blind. It's time someone tells me what the hell is going on here, but I know you won't. Jason, what's the truth? I cut my eyes at my brother, and he looks like a deer in headlights. He slowly sets his beard down and rubs the back of his head. If you want to ask Melly about something, she's right there, Mom. Jason picks up the beer again and drains it. My mom opens her mouth as if she's in shock by Jason's rebuke. She looks at me again, and her eyes narrow when she sees my smirk. Proud that you've managed to turn your brother against me? Really? How the hell did I do that? I didn't realize I had that much power. I stand up this time, ready to take my rage and frustration out on her. Jason must sense it because he stands up too. He's going along with this farce of a marriage or wedding or whatever the hell you want to call what you two are doing. What we're doing is minding our own damn business, lady, Adam says. He stands next to me and wraps a protective arm around me. Sounds to me like you have enough of your own problems to worry about. Don't worry about my wife. She's fine. Flynn, I told you to shut up. Jason walks over and stands in front of Adam. Tell her to shut up, Adam says back. Melanie, I'm not the least bit surprised that you would end up with someone as disrespectful as him. She points to Adam as if saying his name is beneath her. You two are a farce. When this all blows up, I won't be around to pick up the pieces. Adam drops his hand and takes a step closer to her, but I stand between them. Mom, that's enough, Jason warns. When have you ever been around to pick up the pieces for me? To pick them apart? Sure. To criticize and lay blame? Yeah, all day every day, but to actually offer me a shoulder and understanding? That only extends to your son. She gasps and steps back as if struck. I don't need or want anything from you, mother, least of all your fake concern. Melly, enough. Don't say something you'll regret, Jason warns. The only thing I regret is that she moved here. And she's doing it again. She's slowly coming between us, just like she did when we were kids, with the constant favoritism. I'm not doing it anymore. I can no longer live here and I honestly don't want anything to do with you, I say, pointing at our mother. You've always been and will always be toxic where I'm concerned. Oh, where are you going to go? With this wedding nonsense and the new furniture, 
you can't afford to go anywhere. He gave you a fake diamond ring. He couldn't even afford to furnish his own damn apartment. You had to do it for him. And on your dime, I bet. A few years ago, I would have unshed tears in my eyes at her dismissal, but not today. Today, I let out a laugh. I hold out my hand and admire my rings. How do you always manage to get everything wrong where I'm concerned? The question throws my mother off, and she looks around the kitchen as if confused. Don't disparage my husband. He has a job and so do I, Jason and Alex asked me to be here, unlike you, who just barged in. Thank goodness for your son. The only child you ever wanted, because if it were up to me, you'd be living in your car. Melly, that's unfair, Jason says. She never said I was the only kid she's ever wanted. I know you two have your issues, but... Dupree, for a supposedly brilliant doctor, you're either dumb or blind. Maybe both, Adam says. Shut up, Melanie. Just shut your damn mouth, my mother hisses. She looks around the kitchen like a cornered animal. Make me shut up, mother. I dare you. She takes a step back and looks to Jason for help. I walk to my brother, point to him and say, We have our issues, Jason? You're giving me part of the blame for this fucked up relationship? Really? It's my fault I've never been good enough for her? It's my fault that all she ever does is hurt me? My voice turns to venom when I look at Jason in the eye, and all those years of resentment that I thought I had buried resurface. Some things never change. You've succeeded, mother. Congratulations. I practically yell. I'm out of here as soon as we can find another place to live. I'll sleep in the goddamn train station before I live under the same roof as you. Don't you people ever stop. Alex yells. All you do is fight. Diane, do you have to take every opportunity to antagonize Melly? It's such a waste. You have two amazing kids. If you took your head out of Jason's ass long enough, you'd realize it. She spins on her heels and walks out of the kitchen. My mother is stunned silent by Alex's rant. She looks around the room, her chin jutted out in defiance. What are you talking about, mother? What is it that you don't want Melly to tell me? Jason demands to know. My mother visibly pales. She even stumbles a little bit and holds onto the table for support, but she's not down for long before she straightens up and says, I don't know. She's just making trouble as per usual, she says. I scoff and toss my hands in the air. Adam is not so gracious. You're a goddamn liar, lady. He takes a step closer to my mother. But I think this time your precious Jason will finally see you for who you really are. Tell him, Mel. I grab Adam's hand and say, Adam, it doesn't matter. He needs to know, Mel, because if he defends her one more time, I don't know if I'll be able to stop myself from ripping him apart. Tell me what? Jason says, moving closer to our mother. Whatever it is, I want to hear it from you, Mom. Jason takes her elbow to keep her in place when she tries to walk out of the kitchen. Right now. You need to tell me right the hell now. I don't know what she's talking about. Her voice trembles, but she casts her eyes down, almost as if she is too ashamed to look at Jason. The doorbell rings, and we all look around, stunned at the interruption. Alex returns and gets the food from the delivery man. Addie comes and starts to climb on her high chair. Adam picks her up and puts her in it. If you people don't mind, I want to feed my daughter dinner. Alex slams the bag on the table and grabs plates from the cabinet. I've lost my appetite, I say. And I need to talk to my mother. Jason takes hold of our mother's elbow and marches her down the hall. We hear a door slam. I'm so damn sick of all of this, Alex says. So sick of all the fighting. Everything was great until she showed up. Alex rubs a shaky hand to her forehead. 
She opens her mouth to say more, but the shouting from the back of the apartment shuts her up. How the hell could you say something like that? What is the matter with you? Loud weeping follows Jason's bellow. No. Don't touch me. A door opens and slams, then heavy footsteps fill the hall. Jason's eyes are red with rage, something I've never seen from him before. He pulls open the coat closet and grabs his jacket and says, I need some air. He walks out the front door and slams it behind him so hard, the walls shake. My mother comes running down the hall, tears staining her face. She stops short when she sees us, but only long enough to wipe her tears and run to her room. Addie starts to cry, and Alex picks her up. It's a total fucking shit show around here. I'm so damn sick of it. 40. Melly. I'm sorry, Alex. She ignores me while she balances Addison in her arms. I walk out of the kitchen, through the living room, and out the front door. I barely make it halfway up the stairs before Adam catches up to me. He tries to grab my hand, but I pull away when I barge through the front door. I take a quick look out the window while I walk to the bedroom. It's completely dark now, but right by the streetlight, I can see the snow falling out of the sky. The cars below are covered, as is the sidewalk, but I don't care. I burst through the bedroom, the door hitting the wall so hard, I know it will leave a dent. I bend down and pull out the suitcase I keep under the bed. When I get to the dresser, I open a drawer, pull out all the clothes and toss them in the bag. Before I can do the same with another drawer, Adam snatches the bag from me and tosses it across the room. It bangs against the wall and lands on the hardwood floor with a hard crash. You're not leaving me, Mel. His voice is low, almost quiet, but I don't miss the danger simmering underneath. I need to clear my head for the night. I don't want to be under the same roof as you, I tell him. Too bad. Your days of running away when things get hard or uncomfortable are over. We're going to deal with this right now. What are you going to do? Hold me hostage in this bedroom? No. I'm going to cook dinner, and when you're done acting like a child, you can come out so we can talk like adults. I open my mouth to respond to his condescending tone, but he opens the door, walks out, and closes it behind him. I don't stay in the room for long. Just as he slams a skillet on the oven burner, I approach. Don't you dare turn this around on me when you're the one who lied. I stand next to him, suddenly itching for a fight. I didn't lie. I told you I'm my mother's only child. She's the only parent who loves me. She's the one who has taken care of me my entire life. I don't know those people, and I barely knew my father when he was alive. And I already told you, I don't like talking about it. Drop it. For no reason at all, he picks up the skillet and slams it down again. He walks to the fridge and yanks it open so hard, I'm afraid he'll damage the hinges. I told you all the shit with my mother, Adam. I told you about the most hurtful thing she's ever done. You lied to me every time I asked you about the New York number and you told me that your father had no kids. And all this time you let me believe you were struggling financially. You never once. Hold on there, Melanie. Hold one goddamn minute. I know you're having a pity party of one, but I never told you I had no siblings. I told you I was my mother's only child. That's the truth. And I never said I was struggling financially. Not once. You came to that conclusion on your own. And when the hell was I supposed to tell you? Before or after you did one of your spreadsheets? Before or after you told me you were looking for equality in this marriage? Before or after you figured out we're in the same bracket? Whatever the fuck that means. We're equal because we say we are, not because of how much money we bring in. 
you're the one with the ridiculous ideas in your head. And look in the mirror, sweetheart, if you want to talk about liars. My head rolls back as if slapped. I take a deep breath and slowly approach him. His back is still to me while he rummages through the fridge. Excuse me. Now I'm the liar. Stunned by his accusation, I stand behind him and wait for an explanation. You've always been the liar. He closes the fridge door, turns to me and says, look at me in the eye and tell me you were drunk the night we got married. My mouth opens, but suddenly it feels like it's filled with cotton. I lick my lips and stare into my husband's eyes. I, I take another deep breath. I, nothing comes out. You what? You can't say it, can you? The minute you woke up, you ran like a scared rabbit and lied to your family. Said that I got you drunk and tricked you into marriage, when the truth is, you're the one who asked me to marry you. And newsflash, wife, you weren't drunk. I refuse to acknowledge the truth of his words. You're not going to turn this around on me. And for the record, Adam, the answer is before. You should have told me that you're a millionaire before I did the spreadsheets, before I talked about being equal and before I started waking up at the butt-ass crack of dawn to make your lunch so we can save for a house. You've made such a damn fool of me. I'm done talking about it. Now you know. That asshole did me a favor because now I can stop tiptoeing around the money issue. And I love those things about you, Mel. I love cheapskate Mel because she's willing to sacrifice for our future. I'm crazy about 1950s Mel who always leaves a sweet little note in my lunch, and I can't keep my hands off slutty Mel. I loved learning about you that way. I shake my head, too far gone in my anger to listen to his reasoning. Whatever, Adam. What's the real reason you kept this from me? Did you think I would be after your money? Oh, for fuck's sake, Melanie Flynn. He slams the skillet again. I married you without a prenup. You want the damn money. Take it. I don't give a shit about it. He opens the fridge again and looks inside. After a few minutes where the only sound is the rapid beating of my heart, he looks at me and asks, Do you want chicken or beef for dinner? His tone is back to normal, signaling that he's done with this conversation. I don't respond. I turn on my heels, return to the bedroom and slam the door behind me, locking it this time. Forty-five minutes later, while I'm lying on the bed staring at the ceiling, he turns the knob. When met with the lock, he pounds one of his massive fists on the door. Dinner's ready. Open the fucking door. I ignore him. In fact, I turn on the TV and turn the volume on full blast, but that does little to drown out the pounding. He stops a few seconds later, and just when I think he's gone, he knocks the door off its hinges. He stands in the middle of the room looking like a man possessed. I try to scoot off the bed, but he reaches for me and grabs my hands. Once he's pulled me up, he throws me over his shoulder as if I'm nothing more than a bag of dirty laundry and carries me to the kitchen. He sits down, puts me on his lap, and wraps an arm around my waist to keep me in place. He reaches for my plate and puts it in front of me. I made steak since you don't like the way I cook chicken, is all he says. He eats his vegetables and sweet potatoes with one hand, but when it's time to eat his steak, Instead of letting me go so he can use a knife and fork, he picks up the steak with his free hand and eats it like a caveman. My stomach growls. I haven't eaten since breakfast. Tonight was supposed to be a romantic night of being snowed in with my husband. I was supposed to make him dinner, and we were going to spend the night making love either on the couch or in the bedroom. Some nights he'll spread a blanket out on the rug in front of the TV and we'll make love on the floor, but today has turned into a complete shit show. My stomach growls again. I sigh, reach for my fork and eat. 
he only lets me go after I take my last bite. I clear the table and clean up. He doesn't try to talk to me again. While I straighten the kitchen, he sits on the couch and turns on the news. While the weatherman talks about the storm, I walk away and take a shower, hoping it will clear my mind. It doesn't. By the time I come out and put on pajamas, I'm more hurt and confused than when I went in. I'm supposed to meet with the baker on Saturday to sample the different cakes. Last weekend when I looked at flowers with Molly and Ananda, I cheapened out because I had to pay extra for my wedding dress. Now, I just feel like a damn fool with my budgeting and penny pinching. I open one of the spreadsheets and look at what we've already spent compared to expected expenses. I slam the laptop shut just as he walks in. He's in nothing but a green towel wrapped around his waist. Water glistens on his bare chest and droplets fall out of his damp hair. When he drops the towel, I turn away from his semi-hard cock. Still giving me the silent treatment, huh? Okay. When he goes to the drawer to look for his clothes, I grab an extra blanket and pillow from the top of the closet. You are sleeping in our bed, he orders. My bed. When I first moved in here, you said the bed was mine. You're the one who is sleeping on the couch. You can sleep on your weight bench for all I care. I slam the blanket and pillow on his chest, and he looks at me dumbfounded. Not happening. He tosses them across the room and gets on his side of the bed. Since there's no way I'm sleeping with him, I grab the pillow and blanket and leave. I'd slam the door, but it's already hanging off the hinges. I barely have time to get situated on the couch before he comes stomping. You're so damn immature, he says. Come back to bed. I'm fine out here. Fine. Take the damn bed. I'll sleep out here. I hop off the couch and run to the bedroom before the words are fully out of his mouth. He doesn't follow, and I miss having his big body to cuddle with. Most nights, I end up lying right on top of him before falling asleep. As hard as his body is, he's so comfortable to sleep on. It's still relatively early, barely ten o'clock, and instead of being wrapped around my husband, I'm alone on the massive bed. I don't know how long it takes me to fall asleep, but I know I watch television until my eyes become heavy. When I wake up hours later, my legs are spread open and I feel something between them. Warm lips and a hot tongue on my clit. I reach down and feel thick, soft hair beneath my fingertips. He spreads my legs wider and kisses the inside of my thighs. Hot, wet, opened-mouthed kisses. He bites the sensitive flesh softly and I let out a moan. Two fingers slide inside my wet pussy, and I bite my lip at the sensation. Adam, I moan. That's right, love. Say your husband's name. I couldn't say his name again even if I wanted to. His tongue swirls around my entrance right before he bites softly on my clit, and I groan loudly. It doesn't take long for me to come on his mouth. I can feel my juices oozing out. His wet lips finally leave my pussy and kiss the inside of each thigh. My heart is racing while I come down to earth. Adam's still between my legs, but when he starts to climb on top of me, I put a foot on his chest, stopping him. I purposely spread my legs wider, and he moans at the sight. He rubs the back of his knuckles along my pussy lips and pushes my leg off his chest. I can see how hard his dick is. It hits my thigh, and it's like a piece of steel. Uh-uh. I don't think so. Couch. He falls back on his naked ass and looks at me as if I'm speaking a foreign language. You're going to leave me like this. He points at his hard cock, and I admit, it's huge and looking straight at me. It wouldn't take him long to explode, either inside of me or in my mouth. I do my best not to look like I'm ready to pounce in the next five seconds. 
I start to bite my lip, but I stop and stare at the ceiling instead. After you just came on my mouth. Thanks for that. I'll really be able to sleep now. And remember your rule, Adam. The only thing that makes that dick come is me. I lean back on my elbows and look into his face. There's a sheen of sweat on his forehead despite the cool temperatures. These hands. I raise both hands to make my point. This mouth and tongue. I slowly run my tongue over my lower lip, and he groans. This pussy. I open my legs just wide enough for him to see. And this ass. I lay on my side and run a hand down my hip and to the curve of my ass. None of which you're getting tonight. I cover myself with the comforter, shielding my naked body from his greedy eyes. He stands, and his dick sticks straight out, just as hard as it was when he was trying to climb on top of me. You're a jerk, do you know that, Mel? He stomps to the broken-down door, and I can't help but admire his tight ass. I use all my willpower not to beg him to come back to bed so I can grab that ass. He punches the wall by the door, shocking me so much, I let out a gasp. I'd rather be a jerk than a liar. I yell after him. You're the biggest damn liar I've ever met. You lie to yourself and everyone else. Yeah. I'm the one who lied about having fifty million dollars. That's all me, right? I'm the Bradford heir. I hear another thud against the wall. He either punched it or kicked it. Go ahead and break your hand. I'm sure the ER nurse will love to stick a big, fat needle in it. The name's Flynn, sweetheart. Same as yours, he yells. And fuck the Bradfords.